All right, so Professor John William McDonald Agar, who prefers to be called John. John graduated from Monash University Medical School in 1970 and trained in nephrology in Melbourne and UMass Medical School in Worcester, USA. In 1978, he returned to his home in the city of his home city of Geelong, where he established and ran a clinical nephrology practice until his retirement this February. John has published more than 250 peer reviewed papers and abstracts, four book chapters, two dialysis related books, one with me, and more than 90 kidney views blogs as the hemodialysis advisor and internet consultant to the Wisconsin based medical education institute since 2010. He has been an invited lecturer on dialysis topics in 16 countries, especially on his three pet topics, nocturnal home hemodialysis, extended hour and higher frequency hemodialysis, and environmental sustainability in dialysis and nephrology, founding the global concepts of green dialysis and green nephrology, about with which he just had a paper come out today. Among his awards for contributions in nephrology are the Order of Australia, Australia Medal, Australia's highest honor, the Priscilla Kincaid Smith Medal, the International Society of Hemodialysis Zbilut Twardowski Lifetime Achievement Award in Hemodialysis. So I will let John take it away, load up his slides, and we'll get going, and we will do questions at the end. Well, today I'm going to do what I call Dialysis 101. There's a bit of complexity in it, despite the fact that it's uh, titled 101, there are some difficult concepts within it. So uh, yes, have your uh, pens and papers ready. And if there are bits that I uh, gloss over or that you don't understand, we can always go back to that in question time. Uh, it's quite a long one today, so uh, I'll get going. And this is adapted basically from a Kidney Views blog that I put up back in about 2016 or 17, I can't quite remember, entitled Blog from no, to Dialysis Chair Implementing Volume 101. And this is kind of my introduction slide, and, and Dory's already said this, but I've worked in nephrology for some 47 years, and in that time I've uh, sentenced an awful lot of people, ordinary and fearful people, people just like you, to life with dialysis. And uh, every time I have done that over those, those 47 years, I share their sense of dread, despite all the preparation and education that we try and give, when I finally turn around to them and say, look, I think it's time you started dialysis. So we're going to work through some of that today. It is for that very reason that our team does try here, at least, to try and answer questions from new patients and their families, because their families are just as uh, integral in the dialysis process as the patient. As best as we can, as gently as we can, and as respectfully as possible. Doesn't always work out that way, but we do our best. We try to lead them through a process that comes to grips with understanding and coping with dialysis and especially wherever possible dialysis at home because you out there will know that I am a devotee of home dialysis and when I talk home dialysis I'm my own particular interest has been home hemodialysis not peritoneal dialysis although we have a large population of both at home in our unit and to thrive a patient really needs to understand basic dialysis principles. You can't really undertake dialysis without having some concept of what it is that we're trying to do to you. So this slide set seeks to address some of these. But the first thing I want to say is to remind you that every one of us is different. No two of us are the same. Even an identical a set of identical twins uh, while physically very close, will ultimately become individuals due to the impact of life and circumstance upon their uh, development. So each of us responds in a unique way to any single given event. The best defense against changing circumstances is to hear our own self talking, to learn to recognize our own responses, to 
listen to the rhythms and limits of our own personality and body, to learn how our own body speaks to us. Uh, and, and that will be different from one person to another, to feel how our own circulation signals us. And much of my teaching about dialysis relates to the impact of dialysis on the blood circulation and the fluid status of the body. And finally, we need to be able to interpret our own emotions and they will change day to day, treatment to treatment. Some days we feel confident about our treatment, sometimes we don't. And so we need to be able to understand all of the impacts of those factors. On the other hand, a machine is different. A machine is something that is engineered to be safe, to be reliable, and above all, to be predictable. It's designed to do the same thing every time. But remember, you are not the same every time. A machine is and must be the exact opposite of an individual. It needs to be to reliably do exactly what we ask it and expect it to do. So on the one hand, you have you who is constantly changing, morphing, molding across a range of emotions and physical capabilities versus a machine which is there to do exactly the same thing every time. And so this is the dialysis challenge where a machine meets a man or a woman. A dialysis machine must develop a predictable treatment to an unpredictable person. Each dialysis patient will react differently, sometimes just a little, but sometimes quite a lot. And this will always be so, even if the delivered treatment is identical. So you're getting the same treatment, but you are responding to that treatment every time you're on dialysis in a slightly different way. To make matters worse, we don't even feel the same all the time. We respond differently to the very same event at different times. So responses can be quite varied despite the same prescription. And a key benefit of home hemodialysis is the flexibility for a dialysis prescription to try and compensate and match and meld with some of those changes and differences. To cope with variability, we have to have good, unrushed or unhasty, repetitive, empathetic. That means understanding and understanding that on any one particular day, you may be less or more receptive to what we are trying to teach you. But it must also be firm and structured training so that we can equip patients to safely and optimally self-dialyze and Home dialysis is all about self-dialysis. Only the patient, no one else, can know the patient. Even the best of your carers and loved ones and those who try and help you do not know you like you know yourself. This is in, in Australia why we train the patient and not a carer. We don't train carers here. We train patients to do their own di dialysis. It is their own disease, if you like, it's their own responsibility, and they are the best person to know how they respond each and every time they go on to dialysis. Even the best carer in the world cannot feel what you feel if you are the patient. We need to appreciate, be cautious of advice from others, and uh, this slide comes to me particularly from uh, some of my uh, understanding of working on the uh, internet and on the Facebook page, it can be comforting to a patient to ask questions of other patients. But while others may be similar, they are not you. Other experiences may be contradictory or even harmful to you if, if they are trying to interpret what you're experiencing and they get it wrong. And other circumstances are always going to be different. And this includes from me, appreciate, but be cautious of advice from others. Anything I say exactly mirrors the things I've just said, and you need always 
to catch any education I might give you from your own circumstance. In training, you need to learn to know yourself. That phrase, I think it's a biblical one, know thyself. Good training will teach patients to know themselves, not others. Learning about one's self takes time, patience and practice. But once a home trainee learns and understands the responses of self, they can also understand and appreciate that hemodialysis practice can be subtly varied in ways that are much less possible in a centre-based program where the same treatment tends to get given regardless of a circumstance. At home, you can try and meld your dialysis process a little bit, just massaging it, might be pump speed, might be the position you're lying in. All these sorts of things can be managed better if you know yourself. But we must never forget that we are all different and no two of us are exactly the same and no two hemodialysis treatments are ever quite the same either. Where it went wrong? Well, it has gone wrong. It's gone badly wrong. Unfortunately, dialysis has been around now since early 1960s. So that's, uh, you know, 60 odd plus years, maybe a little longer. And early on, we understood renal failure slightly differently to the way we do now. And it was thought to be due to the accumulation of wastes. That was what I was taught 47 years ago. Or rather, if you like, the loss of adequate waste excretion. So the kidneys are responsible for getting rid of waste. When they fail, you don't get rid of waste. Therefore, waste accumulation builds up through a loss of waste excretion. And that was what made you sick. That was the early understanding of chronic kidney disease. Most of the signs and symptoms of kidney failure were thought to be due to the accumulation of toxins. This was how I first was taught and thought of renal failure. And we described renal failure by a term called uremia. We don't use that quite as much now as we used to, but uremia was the normal term used for uh, chronic kidney disease, which was an accumulation of urea in the blood because we thought urea was the nasty. It seemed natural to study and, and focus our attention on waste. And early on, a failure of waste excretion dominated our thinking. The more accepted group term for the toxins in uremia, and there are many more toxins than just urea, we went through that toxin list. I haven't got it on this particular, I should probably have put it on, but it's not on this particular slide set. But those who have been here in the past will remember that vast list from Ray Van Holder of uh, toxins or solutes that accumulate in chronic kidney disease. But even today, many hemodialysis professionals still focus mainly on solutes. And I would claim perhaps that that's the wrong focus. But to be fair to my colleagues and to myself and to everybody over these learning years that have passed, it's not all our own fault. In the mid late 20th century, teaching emphasized measurable chemistry. You've all heard of labs, those things that you have done routinely from time to time to measure stuff. The focus was on the normalization, usually by removal, of those substances that are measured in your lab results, sodium, potassium, bicarb, phosphate, calcium, magnesium. Then came the electrolytes, if you like, that accumulate or change in people with chronic kidney disease. Then there are the toxins, urea, creatinine, parathyroid hormone, beta-2, microglobin, homocysteine, and that massive list of uh, Ray Van Holders that we looked at in a previous session. And then there were other measurables that held our attention too, like hemoglobin and urine protein and a raft of other laboratory tests, the, the labs that everybody keeps referring to on the internet chat sessions. And we were seduced really into thinking that these were what mattered most. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, I don't think that's necessarily quite the case. Even the measure that plots the decline of kidney function 
from CKD3, 4, 5, and so on, is a solute, a substance called creatinine. And you've heard of the uh, EGFR, which is based on the blood creatinine level. And we measure and use a notional formula developed from a muscle waste called creatinine uh, to calculate the key marker of chronic kidney disease and the decline in kidney function. We call it the estimated or E glomerular filtration rate or the EGFR, which has become the yardstick of CKD stratification from the earliest phases of the glimmer of chronic kidney disease through to pre-dialysis CKD5 and CKD5 dialysis. But once dialysis begins, oddly, we have replaced creatinine, that solute that we follow through uh, chronic kidney disease with by another solute called urea. And in the early days of hemodialysis, well, urea was cheap and it's easy to measure. It was thought to be a good marker for the dose, the adequate amount. And everybody here on today's session will know my aversion for the name adequate, because I think adequate places a huge limit on the goodness or the effectiveness of dialysis as it could be delivered. While this has subsequently been shown to be a suspect theory, urea has stuck in the minds of most dialysis professionals. And in some countries, urea has even been accorded a regulatory status. And your country is the standout uh, uh, in this area where using a, a mathematical sleight of hand called KTV urea, uh, a regulatory adequacy test has been introduced into dialysis, which I think has been, in my view, an error and a mistake. The adequacy of a hemodialysis treatment has become enshrined in a complex mathematical equation, which you will all have heard of, uh, called KTV, or if you like, KTV urea. KTV urea seeks to determine if and when enough urea has been removed, but that says nothing about all of the other solutes, if indeed solutes are the uh, main game here, and I contend perhaps they are not, and they're a sideshow rather than the main game, and we'll come to that as we go through this presentation today. But KTV urea measures urea alone. And uh, John de Gerdes came up, there are multiple different uh, mathematical formulae for calcula, which of, of itself is a problem. There are multiple mathematical formulae which are used to calculate KTV urea. This is one of them. And it says that KTV is a, a minus logarithm of all of these things. And you can see what these little UFs and Rs and Ws are down here. And somehow we have reduced the human body to a string of mathematical jargon. And I don't think that's right. Personally, I don't think that we can represent a complex, changing, variable, thinking, moving, loving, living organism into a mathematical formula that looks something like that. And I'll expand on that as we go through. I've never agreed more than I have with Ray Van Holder, who wrote in seminars in dialysis in 2019 the following. The dialysis patient might benefit more if instead the nephrology community concentrated in future on pursuing optimal dialysis dose that conforms with adequate quality of life and factors that are likely to affect outcomes and not just KTV. In other words, KTV, a mathematical formula, we've removed enough urea, turn the machine off and go home. Does that represent quality of life and other factors that are likely to affect outcome? And his view, and I agree, is that that is highly unlikely. Some of these factors, not all of them, but some of these factors might include residual kidney function, a patient's blood volume and tissue and cellular volume status, 
the length of dialysis, the ultrafiltration rate, the number of intradialytic episodes where the blood pressure drops, the interdialytic blood pressure, that means between sessions of dialysis, some of the other measurables like potassium phosphate, albumin, C-reactive protein, a whole raft of other things. In other words, putting all your eggs in the KTV basket ignores all of this stuff and all of this stuff and much more is important. In some jurisdictions, for example, in the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, we use a simpler measure of adequacy. Outside the US, not many people use KTV except perhaps for research purposes, but we use a thing called the urea reduction ratio or URR, that should be URR, not PRU, which if it's expressed in the percentage, uh, the percentage reduction in urea is called the PRU. And that's what uh, we tend to use here. But again, it's a formula which uh, is a spillover from the days when we thought urea mattered most. But the PRU, though an adequacy measure relied upon outside the US, is, as I've just said, based on a solute and a poorly chosen one at that. So even we use an index which is relatively useless. Solute is the easy side of the coin. In hemodialysis, urea removal has been used for decades as a yardstick of adequate dialysis. In peritoneal dialysis, creatinine is still used, the clearance of creatinine, uh, which one might argue is a slightly more representative waste than urea and plays a major monitoring role in PD. Yet both reflect good or bad dialysis in terms of solute clearance and solute removal is the easy side of the coin to read. And that will slowly morph me into the second part of this presentation. Solute clearance has never really quite matched the hype. If we had thought about dialysis more carefully at the start, we might have come to some different conclusions. We might have developed a different set of measures and realized that there are more things that matter than uh, just solute. As young Will said many years ago, there are more things in heaven and earth for ratio than are dreamed of in your philosophy. In other words, the philosophy of urea is only part and perhaps a minor part of the story. Urea does play some role in the osmotic regulation of the body, especially across what's called the blood-brain barrier. Uh, it does contribute to some alterations in taste and smell and to some changes in proteins, but urea of itself rarely kills unless it's ingested neat in concentrated form by farm animals. So urea really doesn't do you an awful amount of harm. Creatinine is a rather gentle toxin. It never makes us sick and it doesn't kill us. Potassium absolutely can kill, but dialysis patients do tend to tolerate quite wild shifts in serum potassium, which is an interesting fact in and of itself. And uh, perhaps need some more understanding uh, placed around it, but even potassium relatively rarely kills. PTH, parathyroid hormone, may do slow and unseen damage to bone, but it takes years to do so, and it too rarely, if ever, kills. And anemia, that's a low blood count or low hemoglobin, makes people feel horrible and certainly makes things harder for the heart, but uh, other than through that mechanism of itself, it rarely kills. Obviously, this slide that I've just gone through is a, is a vast oversimplification, and at least a couple on the list can and do cause long-term damage. But all of those still pale into insignificance against what I would describe as the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, the number one killer, the dialysis beast in the dialysis room is fluid. Fluid overload, fluid in excess in the blood and tissue uh, compartments of the body, over volume or hypervolemia. And the blood pressure is a surrogate marker 
for that excess fluid. So solutes play a role, but fluid is the thing that kills. And we'll spend a bit of time now looking at that concept. What really matters is how fluid moves. And it does move. It moves across basically three compartments in the body. If you can think of your body as being comprised of cells, which contain fluid, of fluid that bathes and surrounds and uh, melds around and in between the cells, so-called the extracellular outside cells, extravascular outside the blood vessels, interstitial fluid, and then there's the fluid in the blood vessels themselves. And fluid moves between these compartments from the cells to the interstitium, the space between the cells, from that space between the cells, the interstitium, to the blood compartment, and from the blood circulation across the dialysis membrane to the effluent outflow from the dialyzer. And it is this movement and transition of fluid from compartment to compartment that matters. And remember that dialysis can only access the blood circulation. It does not access the interstitium except by inference from the movement of fluid from the interstitium into the blood circulation whence the dialysis process removes fluid, and of course, from the cells to the interstitium. So the, this movement of fluid is what really matters. And fluid mechanics and fluid location are the true markers of the morbidity and mortality of dialysis. What really matters is fluid volume, as it reflects, firstly, the total amount of fluid in the body. We'll call it total body fluid load. And the rate of change, the rate at which fluid moves from one compartment to the other. And when you are removing fluid from the blood volume in dialysis, you create a drag that pulls fluid from the interstitial fluid to replenish the blood volume. And when you pull fluid from the interstitial fluid into the blood volume, that creates a drag which pulls fluid from the cells into the interstitial. But each of these steps is rate limited. It doesn't flow whoosh across uh, from one compartment to the other. It is a slow dragging process. So as you contract the blood volume, it takes time for the blood volume to be restored. And as you contract the interstitial fluid, it takes time for the cells then to restore interstitial fluid. Fluid is the primary determinant of health or ill health in dialysis patients. Fluid volume, especially if it changes rapidly during dialysis, remember that dialysis only accesses the blood volume. So if you change the blood volume very rapidly, That'll knock you off. You can't just take the bottom out of the volume status of the, of the blood vessels. But it takes time for those that volume to be restored from the other fluid containing compartments in the body. Our blind devotion to numbers, our insistence on endless lab tests, our fear tactic to get your numbers right these are what have sold you short when we really should be looking at how we manage this exchange of fluid, this movement of fluid, and really all of this stuff looks after itself. So we are not lab focused here. Yes, it matters. Yes, you need to know some of these numbers and obviously you need to try and get them right, but it's not the be all and end all of dialysis. What has always mattered most has been blood tissue and cellular volume. And as we think about fluid volume in excess or in deficit, it is the rate at which that dialysis changes that fluid balance across those three compartments that is the key prime factor, the ultra filtration rate. And 
those of you who've read some of the stuff that I write and those blogs, and you've heard me talk about it in other sessions that we've had up until now, and I'll come back to it in future sessions if you dare to even attend any of them. This is what determines those dialysis patients who will live, who will live well, and who will live long, and will also determine those who likely will not. So ultrafiltration rate is the key determinant of life, good life, long life, and those who don't. And we need to correct a wrong here. We need to be upfront, be brave enough to say we've made a mistake because I think we have made a mistake to be so focused on solute and so unfocused on fluid. We need to reorient ourselves. We need to alter our emphasis. We need to re-educate ourselves. And then we need to re-educate the patients. So dialysis professionals need to do all of these things. We've slaved for decades to get the numbers right, but at the same time, we've been puzzled why this approach has made such little difference to patient well-being and survival. We've slaved away at getting all the numbers right, but we haven't really dented how well our patients feel and how long they survive or how well they survive. And it's past time that we altered the order, put solute second and talk first and foremost about volume and get you, the patients, to understand the importance of fluid and fluid control. And that doesn't necessarily mean draconian fluid restriction. It is how dialysis manages and best allows time for ultrafiltration to occur. And that brings me, of course, to that key name or word, four-letter word in dialysis that should be at the forefront, tattooed on every dialysis professional's forehead, and that is time. Okay, now I'm into a, a good parable that tells a story that is parallel to uh, another story that matters. Think of a river system. And here's a river that starts up in the headwaters in the mountains, and little tributaries that begin to gradually join together. It moves and, and winds its way through the uplands, past a town, meanders down into a lake, which is just short of the sea, and then ultimately to the sea. So a river is a watershed, if you like, leading via, we'll say, a containing lake into the sea. It's been raining like cats and dogs up in the mountains, and there's a huge storm in the mountains, and the headwaters and the uplands flood with water, and upstream, everything is being drenched and sodden, the roads are cut, people are scrambling uh, to save their stuff. But down here by the sea, you know, the sun's shining, the little boats are sailing on the lake, and there is no inkling of what is going on yet upstream. So as the flood moves down the river, it gets to the town, and the town is flooded, and people are struggling to save their stuff in the town as the flood waters pass by. But meanwhile, down by the sea where the lake is, the sun is still shining, people are boating and fishing, and as yet, there is no evidence that much trouble is approaching. We'll assume there's a news blackout. It will take ages for those floodwaters to make their way downstream to the lake and, the, and flood the houses on the lake shore. So what this is showing you is the slow movement of fluid. There's no way you can hurry it up. You can't uh, make it come any quicker, but you also can't stop it. Someone who lives down by the lake has a bright idea, a bit of false security, if you like. And he's heard that there is a flood coming and that when it comes, it will flood their lakeside houses. So he says, right, what if we just pump the lake dry, pump all of its water out into the sea, and then when the floods come, the lake will fill with the flood waters, but it won't flood our houses. But that's false security. 
because draining the lake will not draw the flood waters down the river any faster. They will still come when they come in their own time. Floods move slowly. Fluid moves slowly. Meanwhile, draining the little lake will leave everything in the lake high and dry. The fish will die. Uh, things that require a healthy lake will be ruined. Everything will cark it uh, in the lake as you drain it in the hope that it might be sufficient to contain the flood waters when they come. So despite destroying the lake, the flood will still eventually come. So doing this, draining the lake, whipping water out of the lake is a false security because the lake is small, but the flood is large and draining the lake will not stop the flooding of the houses on the shore for the flood is far larger than the lake. But in draining the lake, you will ruin the ecology of the lake beyond repair if it is drained. Let's now see how fluid overload and dialysis fits into this example. The mountains and the upland plains represent the cells where most of the fluid collects in the body. So they get flooded. The lowland plains and the town represent the interstitium, that halfway house, if you like, between the cells and the circulation. The little lake represents the circulation, the blood volume, which is the smallest fluid volume in the body. And of course, dialysis is the drain, but a drain that can only access the lake, not the lowland plains, not the mountains, not the upland plains, just the lake. So if you suck fluid out of the lake, or if you suck volume out of the blood, this will have a huge effect on the lake, or if you like, the circulation, but drying up the circulation will have no significant effect on the fluid in the interstitium, the lowlands or the plains, and drying up the circulation will be of no benefit to the cells which are flooding on the upland plains and in the mountains. The only outcome of drying up the circulation will be to destroy the blood volume and all that depends upon it is nourished by it or lives within it. So kill the circulation, fine, kill the patient by drying up the circulation, will have no significant effect on the fluid that is still yet to come because that process takes time. If the blood volume is aggressively contracted, all the structures that depend upon a well-preserved blood volume for healthy function are put at risk. The heart, the brain, the residual kidneys, the gut, so-called splanchnic circulation, and all the other organs that are sustained by a healthy blood volume will be damaged. So there are two better options. One option is to reduce the amount of water that makes up the flood. That is, in other words, limit the amount of rain that falls. But clearly that can't be done in my weather analogy. We can't control the weather. We can to an extent do it in the human body. We can impose fluid intake restrictions to, if you like, reduce the size of the storm. But we all know that in practice, that is far from simple. And it's a very difficult thing to ask a patient to limit their fluid intake. Many find it difficult to reduce fluid intake enough to prevent at least some degree of flooding. The second option is to remove fluid from the circulation slowly at a rate as close as possible to the rate at which fluid arrives from upstream. Now, if you contract or remove fluid from the blood volume, it is replaced by fluid from the interstitium. But that is rate limited, and that rate limit is called the plasma refill rate. Now, I have a whole uh, session on plasma refill rate. It's in one of the series coming up, which will explain this a little bit better. I'm going to gloss over that today. But by removing fluid from the circulation slowly, this will ensure that the circulating blood volume will remain stable 
but in the process, you are still managing the excess water load as effectively as possible. Doing this is a slower process, but a far more effective and safe one. And it introduces the only golden rule in dialysis. And the golden rule of dialysis is good dialysis takes time. And it's because of that absolute golden rule that the process that I have always favoured, that I learned from Andreas Pieratus in Toronto, and that I've practised wherever possible ever since, as has Bob Lockridge and many others around the world, and that is slow, gentle, frequent, long, overnight dialysis, nocturnal dialysis. Better still, if we can combine option one and option two by applying sensible but not draconian fluid limits to you know, make the flood a little less severe, but also draining the lake at the same time as the flood arrives from upstream, removing fluid from the blood volume at the same rate as the interstitium can replenish it, then it's all about simple fluid mechanics. Combining sensible fluid restriction with slower, gentler, and there's one word missing in there, more frequent dialysis. This will minimize the upstream and downstream damage, even as more and not less fluid is removed. This is what's called simple fluid mechanics, but mechanics takes time. The moral of the parable is that slow, gentle dialysis, what I would describe as optimum dialysis, minimally disturbs the blood volume, but will ultimately remove far more fluid than fast, damaging, self-limiting drying ever can. Good dialysis is all about ensuring stable fluid mechanics. Solutes still matter, yes, but they matter less. And modern dialysis equipment really copes very easily with the clearance of most, if not all, solutes. Either we've forgotten this or perhaps we never really understood it well in the first place. A home dialysis patient should be able to be the master of his or her own dialysis settings. And we teach our patients to manipulate, change the circumstances of their dialysis relative to, for example, how long they uh, have been off dialysis, how much fluid they've gained, what their weight gain is. Uh, maybe if you've gained a bit more weight, you do a longer dialysis session so that you're always trying to keep the rate at which you remove fluid under control. A well-trained home dialysis patient can or should be able to read the tea leaves of his or her, her own physiology. In other words, remember when, when I started this session, I talked about how we are variable things change. One session is never the same as the other. And a home patient is in a position or should be able to be taught how to understand their own physiology and react to it. A well-trained home dialysis patient can or should be able to make his or her own adjustments in treatment duration and frequency to offset any alteration in day-by-day -day circumstances. And we encourage our patients to make those changes. They don't need to follow a prescription. They need to follow some principles. But a prescription means a set set of rules. And that is a recipe for disaster. And it is essential that those rules can be manipulated by a trained and sensible home dialysis patient to access the very best dialysis they can. And perhaps this should be in red and in bold, a well-trained home patient can and should, not or should, can and should be trusted. So a home patient should develop, can develop, does develop trust with the people who are helping them, not following a blind set of rules, but being trusted to make their own decisions to optimize their own dialysis. A bit more fluid to remove? Dialyze longer or pop in an extra treatment if or when needed. 
this decision not taken by me or the dialysis uh, staff, but a decision taken by the patient. So they need to understand when to dialyze longer, when to pop in an extra treatment, and that's part of being taught how to be a home dialysis patient. Match the rate of fluid removal, the draining of the lake to the sea, with the influx of tissue fluid as it moves from compartment to compartment as the flood moves downstream. This ensures that the circulation, lake if you like, remains ideally filled even as fluid is being removed. The ultrafiltration rate must flexibly match the duration of each dialysis to the rate of fluid removal. More fluid to remove, do a longer treatment so that you keep the rate of fluid removal under control. And there's a kind of figure here that I've used, which is under about seven to eight mils per kilogram of body weight per hour of dialysis. Now, uh, in the United States, the figure is 13. I can't understand that. We, I have to say, started off at 10, but have slowly reduced the rate of fluid removal so that even in our centre-based patients, the mean rate of ultrafiltration rate for all of our centre patients is 7.6 mils per kilogram of body weight per hour. And we do that by extending the duration of the therapy where appropriate. Though the lower the rate, the better. And I know that Charles Chazot in France published a very nice paper that showed the advantages of reducing the rate of fluid removal per kilogram per hour improves all the way down to less than six mils per kilogram per hour. And of course, home dialysis patients run at about two, the nocturnal patients. So that matters. A urine output is a bonus. Some patients, not all, will sustain a residual urine output. And where this is so, the UFR can be kept at or near zero. And if fluid does not need to be removed, don't remove it. Indeed, there are some patients who need to have fluid given during dialysis. The ultrafiltration rate can be easily set to isovolemic. That means fluid neutral dialysis. There is no rule emphasize no rule that says that ultrafiltration volume must be X. So there's this concept, and, and I understand it does appear in a number of particularly US dialysis units where, oh, you have to remove at least 300 mils of fluid every hour of dialysis. That's absolute bunkum. And there is no rule that says that that is required. If there's no fluid to remove, don't remove it. There is some interest in what's called ultrafiltration profiling. It's become a hot topic. I'm not going to deal with it in great depth here, but this is where the ultrafiltration rate might be varied during dialysis, perhaps a higher rate at the start of dialysis and a lower rate at the end. That's still, I think, in the research area. You wouldn't want to put any rules around that, but even if there is a place for ultrafiltration profiling in centre, carefully done by competent teams. This is neither necessary nor sensible to do at home. And for home patients, the simpler, more effective levers of variable duration and greater frequency are the standout options. The safest and most amenable and important variables in any dialysis process, duration and treatment frequency. Duration and frequency govern all else. Both have their distinctive benefits and advantages and skimping on time or frequency will fool no one but yourself. And it does immeasurable harm to do so. Home dialysis patients possess the training or should, the ability, the wherewithal and the right to do optimal dialysis like no other patient can, with duration and frequency the twin keys to successful and fulfilling life on dialysis. The role of the dialysis professional, that's us, should be to teach safe, well-taught and flexible home care to as many patients as possible. So having gone through this very long session, having patients uh, to wind up, having patients and professionals 
understand the principles behind good dialysis management will be a major step towards achieving the goal of good dialysis. And I hope that this session may have helped achieve that. There was a fair bit in that, and I hope that I haven't left too many of you um, uh, wondering what the hell has he been talking about, uh, but I'm happy now uh, to take questions after I wet my whistle with a bit of coffee. Kyle was hoping that you could bring up the slide about potassium removal, and then Amy has a question after Kyle's question. I really didn't speak much about potassium removal. I, oh, you're right. That was the slide where you're like, this probably won't kill you. This won't kill you right away. This is not as likely to kill you as you think. And potassium yeah. was, was on that list. Um, oh, he uh, said there was there was verbiage on there I wanted to clarify. Yeah, it was probably around uh, my comment that uh, dialysis patients actually tolerate. Uh, oh, correct me if I'm wrong. Tolerate Carl. swings in potassium. Yeah, that is quite large mean. swings in potassium. Um, that probably would kill uh, me or you. Um, that was uh, it, swings, but, he says. But, but uh, in, and remember when we're measuring potassium, we're really only measuring the serum potassium. True. We're not measuring cellular potassium. Yes. And the changes in cellular potassium are much less. So there is, there can be quite a large drop. For example, you might come in for dialysis with a potassium, we'll say, uh, hopefully not of, of, uh, of, of six. And we don't get our knickers in a knot of, uh, uh, over anything really under about six. But you come in with a potassium, let's say, of 6.5, uh, and your end dialysis potassium, uh, depending upon the concentration of potassium in the uh, dialysate, in the bath, if you like, which could be... Uh, zero, one, two, or three millimoles of potassium. So depending upon the, uh, the gradient between your blood potassium and the bath potassium, potassium will uh, drop either steeply or uh, less steeply. But uh, you might go home with a potassium of 2.8 or three, having come in with a potassium of say 6.1 or 6.2. So it looks as though you've effectively halved your uh, potassium load. You actually haven't. You've reduced your serum potassium, but you haven't done the same to your cellular potassium. And it's really the cellular potassium that matters. Uh, uh, if you were to do to halve your cellular potassium, we'd kill you. But that's not how it happens. We're only measuring uh, the, the labs are measuring what's happening in the bloodstream. They're not measuring what's happening in the interstitium or in the cells, uh, only in the bloodstream. So, uh, and, and those changes in the bloodstream may not well reflect what is happening at a cellular uh, uh, or interstitial level. Does I, uh, Ask Kyle if that helps. Kyle, did that help? Um, I learned something new. I did not realize that. It makes perfect sense now that you spell it out because I know the same thing happens with magnesium. Well, at least Absolutely. I know that only 1% of, of magnesium is in the bloodstream. So, you know, 99% of it isn't. And if you test it, it doesn't really tell you that much. Um, so let's wait for... Well, Which is my whole concept of saying that, you know, I mean, I'm not saying labs don't matter, but labs lie. So, so Kyle's follow-up is, so does that mean that really potassium is only an issue if it's high, if serum potassium is high? Well, and there are two if, other questions. If the, if the potassium, if the serum potassium is six, it's uh, at the start of dialysis. That potassium has had two days, let's say, to equilibrate and gradually rise, so that your serum potassium probably does reflect uh, a an equilibrated potassium across all the compartments of your body at the start of dialysis, but at the end of dialysis it only really effectively is telling you what's happening in the serum because you haven't pulled all of that potassium out of the cells. He has a Just transplant now, so I'm not sure, Kyle, if this is a dialysis question or a transplant question. And, and Linda's um, question is, is, is there a way to measure cellular potassium? My no. understanding is there is no way to measure cellular no. anything. Correct. Yeah, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't chunk, have access to it. Take a chunk of your cells, um, 
uh, crush them up in a little. Yeah, you'd have to take a biopsy. That's vessel, what you have to do. Uh, and then measure the the soup at the end, and that, yep. yeah, that's not really a practical thing to do. No. So I'm going to so, go back to Amy's question, and Amy was saying, if fluid doesn't need to be removed, you say don't remove any. Correct. What about the wash back? We call it rinse back here, but wash back, rinse back, same thing. In the UK, we remove the wash back amount, so we're not adding extra fluid at the end. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm going to sort of say, well, yes, you could do that. Uh, but the amount of, uh, of fluid in a wash back uh, is relatively minor uh, in terms of a couple of hundred mils, that sort of thing. So that's really not gonna make uh, a large amount of difference either way. You can uh, say, all right, the washback is 200 mils, so we'll remove 200 mils so that you remain fluid uh, neutral uh, as a, uh, after the washback, fine. But uh, does that make, um, that pales into insignificance to the three kilos or four kilos or five kilo weight gains that uh, uh, people will have, and you're, you're quibbling here about 150 mils at the end of dialysis. Uh, I don't, I don't really, I, I don't see that as a major issue one way or the other. Okay, Steve. And I, I don't know whether that helps, um, uh, Amy. Are you happy with that, Amy? Let's see. Um, she says yes. yes thanks. Yeah, that's good. Right. Thank you, Amy. And I Kyle, Kyle love the detail. And Stephen has a question about his blood pressure dropping after he gets up. So he said, I'm suffering really badly at the moment with postural hypotension on standing. I get three to five- At the end of dialysis, I take it. After treatment, right? Uh, uh, I, he's, uh, I get from what he's gotta, saying- Do you wanna unmic not. Mic yourself? Yeah, is okay. that possible or is your yeah. mic just not working? No, 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 it's fine. It's on. Oh, I've, good, I've, good, good. Okay, so I have a so it, suspicion of what John's going to say. I'm just interested to see if he says what I think he will. Okay, so um, so it, it's happening, I would say, in the 24 hours after dialysis, because I'm, I'm on an, on every other night nocturnal treatment. Hmm. And on the day after, the day after treatment, uh, if there's a knock on the door or the phone rings and I jump up to answer it, I get three to five meters and I'm, I'm genuinely having to cling on to something to stay upright. Uh, I'm losing vision, losing vision. I'm, if, if I wasn't holding on to something, I would hit the deck for sure. Um, I'm, but it's, it's, I'm, I, I hear you. I understand. I understand where you're coming from. Um, there are a number of, uh, of, of potential feeders into that. I'm obviously going to say you're clearly not on any antihypertensive drugs. No. So you're not on beta blockers, you're not on ACE inhibitors, you're not on anything that um, might drop, might affect your blood pressure medication-wise. You only, you know, I'm on bisoprolol one, one even in one in the evening. I think it's a two point five mil. Um, that may have a small effect, but not a lot. But so, uh, bisoprolol is not a a major contributor there. The second thing is, are you diabetic? No, because uh, people with diabetes have. Um, uh, problems with maintaining uh, 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 lying to erect um, uh, blood pressures uh, because of the damage to small blood vessels that are uh, responsible for causing vasoconstriction when you stand uh, and, and to protecting you against things like postural uh, drops in blood pressure. So if you're not diabetic, that rules that out. If you're not on any hypertensives, that rules out uh, that. Uh, is your what are your blood pressures? Uh, let's say, tell me what your your uh, a major blood pressure would be for you, a, a, a top blood pressure. Okay, I'm um, so, sort of around one ten to one fifteen is typical. Well, you're probably, if anything, running yourself a little dry. Yep, yep. Uh, would be my it would be. I mean, now you you have to remember that I can't diagnose you over the internet. Uh, I can't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you've got to be very careful that you don't interpret what I'm saying as actually this is what the problem is. But it Absolutely. would make me wonder whether you are actually uh, drying yourself down too far. 
and that you yeah. could actually allow because if your if your maximum blood pressure is sitting at about 110, I know you're on bisoprolol, and that's almost certainly because you have some cardiac issues, yeah, uh, which I don't know anything about. But nevertheless, uh, one possibility is that you could perhaps uh, run yourself a little a little wetter. Yeah. Or but that is, would be something more. you would need to check with your uh, uh, clinical advisors and run that possibility past them. It's it's in my next review <laughs> because it's, okay. this has only been happening in the last maybe, so, maybe the last month. Yeah. Did, I, did you change you, anything in the last month? You're I've also had. you're also relatively new to dialysis. Uh, three, nocturnal. Relatively yeah. new to nocturnal. Right. Nocturnal, when, yeah. Almost everybody, well, this is a, a horrible generalization, but uh, I'm going to say it anyway. Most people who are on center-based dialysis are fluid overloaded, yeah. even when they think they're not. Uh, but when you go on to uh, nocturnal dialysis, slowly over a period, and this is what the group in Tassan showed, um, uh, Bernard Sharar and others uh, uh, in Tassan, is that uh, volume status slowly improves over a period of about four to six weeks on dialysis. And so imperceptibly, your volume status comes down and your fluid status comes down so that by six to eight weeks into your dialysis program, uh, your uh, uh, tissue fluid uh, has, uh, and your, your, your fluid volume has normalized when it wasn't normal when you're on center-based dialysis. And you may be now beginning to show the evidence of that uh, and that you've actually gone a little far. And that's what I would be um, yeah. interested in, in that, looking at. That makes absolute sense. Yeah, makes absolute sense. Uh, I, I can say, I mean, I've, I've raised it with my nurse this, this week and uh, it will be on my next review with my, with my consultant which is, I think, three weeks away, something like that. So, okay. Um, but, yeah, that, that's interesting to, to know. But just as you'd brought up um, hypovolemic issues earlier, I thought, that there's the question that I want to ask. Oh, Gail has a question. Yep. I'm curious about the relationship of the fluid in the lungs during pneumonia with dialysis. They, uh, my husband's in the hospital at the moment, and they told me they were going to dialyze him every day in center because they wanted to remove fluid from his lungs. Um, is that? Yeah, I, I can make a general if, comment about that, and that uh, uh, um, if he has uh, a lung infection, and I'm hearing that that's what they think he's got, correct? So he's, he's got a pneumonia or something. Yes. Right. Uh, a, a very brief comment on that is that uh, the uh, that infection changes the permeability of blood vessels, uh, so that they become leaky, uh, and uh, you can you can get interstitial fluid. That means fluid in in, in the tissue of the lung. Not so much the, the lung is an interesting organ. Uh, because there are air sacs, so-called alveoli or alveoli, and then there is the tissue that surrounds that, which carries the little blood vessels that do the gas exchange, right? So-called the interstitium of the lung, which is the uh, uh, not the air sac and uh, the internal side of the air sac itself, but the fluid that, or the, 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 the tissue that surrounds the air sacs, the, stru the structure of the lung. And when you have a pneumonia, the, uh, the small blood vessels that uh, run throughout the lung and are responsible for your air, uh, for your oxygen um, absorption, uh, and lie in that interstitium, they leak. And so the interstitium gains fluid. So you get this thing called interstitial uh, edema or interstitial fluid in the lung, which is separate to uh, fluid within the alveolar uh, uh, air sacs. So there's two types of, um, of edema in the lungs, if you like. There's edema that uh, collects in the, in the little air sacs themselves, rather like leaving your Christmas lights out in the rain and you get some, uh, 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 a bit of air in the, a bit of water in the, in the globe, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, versus the tissue that's around it. And he's got interstitial edema. And that's because he's uh, got an infection, made his tissue, his, his capillaries a little more leaky. So he's leaked uh, 
extra fluid into the incision. And that's a different thing to uh, alveolar uh, uh, edema, which is the sort of edema you get in heart failure. Okay. That's useful. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure that I've explained that as well as I could, but that's sort of an off the cuff. Uh, I, and I, I'm not I sure that even necessarily is the case, but it's the first thing that I would have thought about that he's probably got interstitial uh, pulmonary edema, not alveolar edema. Okay, well, that's helpful. Is there a way to listen to the difference or, or to Absolutely. tell? Absolutely, and you can, uh, look, you can, you can detect it with um, uh, high quality X-ray, with ultrasound, all mm. sorts of different things allow you to differentiate between alveolar edema and its interstitial edema. edema. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, there are multiple ways in which you can do that, but uh, um, uh, that, that's all uh, re requires imaging and stuff like that. High quality uh, or high so-called high resolution CT scanning, uh, MRI, all of those things will help you to distinguish the types of edema, uh, the, the two types of edema in lung. Well, this is our first experience with pneumonia. So, and because of COVID, I'm not allowed in the hospital and they're so busy with COVID, I've talked to no one. So when they called me and said, we're doing dialysis every day this week, I was surprised. That's, so, that's a good thing. Well, uh, I, it I is a good thing. And it um, also when people are uh, 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 ill, um, more dialysis is more slow and gentle dialysis is usually better than infrequent and um, uh, bazooka dialysis. And that's uh, a general rule of thumb. And of course, one of the problems that, we, that you have when you're a nocturnal dialysis patient and you're doing maybe four or five or six nights a week uh, and nice, long, gentle dialysis, and you go into the hospital and what do they do? They put you on three times a week, uh, four hours. Uh, which is exactly the opposite of what you should be getting. Uh, 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 and, um, you know, uh, often that relates to the logistics of providing dialysis in a hospital setting, all of those sorts of things. But uh, the, the patient who is ill tends to be slapped into hospital and get less dialysis uh, rather than more. And the fact that uh, I'm hearing that he's getting more dialysis is a good thing. I think so too. All right, any other questions? Can I speak or is that okay? There you are, hi. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, I wanna thank uh, both of you for putting this on, I really appreciate it. Uh, to me, it's a meeting like uh, John Lennon or somebody because you guys are, are, are awesome. It's I really true, he's so great. Uh, I, uh, I really appreciate your book. It was a book that I could really understand and um, I try to promote it as often as I can. I'm a little frustrated though, because it seems like nobody gets it. I do uh, 28 hours of dialysis a week. I do four every day. That works for me. I tried nocturnal. I'd love to do it, but I'm a really light sleeper. I haven't been successful in that, but uh, maybe I'll try it again right now. I'm, I'm 62 years old. You probably heard this. I work uh, every day. Uh, I work on my old truck. Um, I uh, like, I do stuff that I did when I was 30 and 40 years old and uh I know my doctor, like my, my, my whole family's got polycystic kidney. Uh, I'm the only one left. Uh, my mom and dad both had it. Um, I remember being there with my dad a lot and he'd say, you know, you can try this uh, home hemodialysis and you do it more often. And uh, there are people that are athletic and keep up with their athletics. And I said, I thought right away, this is before I was on dialysis. That's the dialysis for me. I don't want to be the you know, I'd see my dad coming off of dialysis and he'd be beat up. I uh, could hardly walk after, you know, um, mind you, he started when he was older. But, uh, you know, he was actually a guy who helped me build my house when he was 69 on dialysis and still wheeling the uh, wheelbarrow with me, you know. So uh, he did very well. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, um, doing more frequent dialysis is, is really the way that it works. And for me, uh, just doing it every day. Uh, four hours really works for me. Uh, the way I explain it to people that don't really understand the dialysis is uh, I tell them that this 
is dialysis is like a journey and it doesn't really matter um there's not much you can do about it you like the i'll, I'll use this as an example it's like a journey i gotta go 28 miles if i'm only gonna do uh it in in uh two hours i'm gonna be running at 14 miles an hour and i'm gonna feel like crap when i'm done and it'll i'll be feeling terrible and i don't think most of us can run that fast probably can't even do it in four hours but if you're doing 28 miles in 28 hours it's like a journey it's like a walk in the park and that's how my dialysis is because i do it i rarely take off uh, if i take off 0.5 of a liter in uh per hour that's a lot because usually I'm, I'm less than that and uh i think that like i say when i'm done this it'll be uh well i started early it'll be about 10 o'clock tonight I'll be able to take my dog for a walk or even if run and chase them right after dialysis. I don't have that issue. But I do find that uh, when I do dialysis at the clinic, I don't do it that night. I do it the next morning. And just those few hours of not doing it that night and the next morning, I feel like crap the next day, you know, after dialysis. So I think um, you're reflecting what um, pretty much everybody on home dialysis and who does uh, both f more frequent and more, um, uh, or more gentle dialysis uh, would say. Uh, and uh, you've come to your own appropriate conclusion and uh, you, the way you feel is proof of the pudding. So uh, well done. I mean, not everybody can uh, uh, manage uh, nocturnal dialysis. Uh, some people are light sleepers or have difficulty sleeping. Uh, we're aware of that. I, I, we tend to drug people uh, to sleep sometimes. <laughs> I don't mean that. I'm being a little bit jocular there. But uh, yeah, some people don't manage a, a nocturnal dialysis uh, well. And if it doesn't suit them, it doesn't suit them. But then you get your way around it like you have and do uh, frequent uh, shorter hour uh, waking hour dialysis and uh, achieve the same uh, end, essentially the same end result. So uh, well done and uh, uh, more strength to your arm. Well, thank you very much. And I, like I say, I really appreciate uh, being able to speak uh, to both of you. And I appreciate, you know, your years of, uh, of uh, service you've done for the community. And uh, I just hope that uh, more and more people can come to the conclusion that I, that I've uh, found out uh, this way. Anyways, I appreciate, uh, you know, the wisdom that you share and uh, also Dory, the work that she does. I think dialysis patients in general would benefit from listening to some of these and, and, and going through some of these talks. Um, so if you can share it around and say, look, you know, why don't you log on the next one and have a listen, uh, uh, all, all the better. I just encourage you in your own time, when you're spending time on dialysis, you may as well spend it gainfully and uh, uh, work through some of these uh, old slide decks and and uh you know gain some wisdom if you have to Absolutely, do it Absolutely, i appreciate it <laughs> the uh all right well uh the, all the best to you from uh down here in uh, covid free australia all right well john thank you so much that was terrific i learned several new things which is always great thank you all uh good to see your happy face there henning at now nearly two o'clock in the morning well done mate well done. I'm just, I'm just sleeping half, half of it. <laughs> but it was wonderful listening to your voice again. It's been a while. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody.